Right. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the third webinar of the Corneat Lab. Following two successful and well-received webinars, we're here with you tonight with another interesting topic. For those of you joining us for the first time, a reminder that you can keep informed of the Cornea Club activities through our website and Facebook page, and you can watch the recorded webinars on our YouTube channel. We welcome your questions and participation through the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen, and we will try to discuss them at the end of the session as time allows. Our session tonight is also live streamed through our Facebook page and YouTube channel, and we would like to thank Medicom Healthcare for sponsoring the event. Now for tonight's session, I would like to introduce the moderator of the Cornea Club, Mr. Mohamed El Alfi, consultant in corneal surgery at the Corneoplastic Unit and Eye Bank at Queen Victoria Hospital, East Grinstead, UK. Hi, Mr. El Alfi. And uh, our speaker, Professor Dua, who really needs no introduction, as he's a world authority on cornea and ocular surface disease, a living legend of cornea surgery. And um, just to name a few of Professor Dua's surgical innovations that are used internationally and have changed the clinical practice. So we all know the Dua's classification of ocular surface burns. We know the use of fine needle diathermy for treatment of corneal neovascularization. We know the sequential sector conjunctival epithelectomy for corneal conjunctivalization. And obviously the discovery of the brick testament's corneal layer, the dual, Dua's layer, as a part of the surgical anatomy of the cornea, which has improved the understanding of layer separation in dark surgery and has led to the concept of PDEC. Now, Professor Doe is also a prolific writer with over 300 publications. He has served as the president of Eucornia, the president of the Royal College of Ophthalmologists, and he has been featured many times amongst the most powerful ophthalmologists in the world. So the list of scientific achievements goes on. But what we may not be familiar with is that uh, Professor Dua has also received high honors. He's um, been appointed commander of the Order of the British Empire, which is the highest ranking order of the British Empire Award, and recently installed as High Sheriff of Nottinghamshire, one of the oldest roles in the country going back over a thousand years. So it is our great privilege to have Professor Dua, who will talk, talk about DALC, DMEC, and PDEC, science and surgery. And I will now hand over to Mr. El Alfi. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Artemis, and I welcome uh, Professor Doa, my uh, uh, longtime mentor and uh, friend. I still go uh, to him with uh, lots of questions every uh, now and then. So, please, Professor Doa, if you can start. Thank you very much uh, for that very kind introduction and for this very kind invitation to be a speaker on the Cornea Club uh, lecture series and uh, get my things going up and minimize this. So I'm going to talk to you about DALC, DMEC, PDEC, science and surgery. And some of this you probably already know, but a revision always helps. So let's go straight into it. And this video shows you air being injected into a human sclerocorneal disc. It's, you're facing the endothelial side. Note the air that escapes at the periphery and this bubble forming in the center, which forms from the center towards the periphery, does not go all the way. And you saw a lot of air escaping at the periphery. And here are some examples of these bubbles. And we call this the type 1 bubble. The layers that it is lifting up are being lifted up because they are impervious to air. Air doesn't go through them. If air had gone through them, then they wouldn't have come up like this bubble. Now, if you look at the human situation. So here, a deep trephination in the human cornea has been made, a 30 gauge needle beveled down over a drop of helon for some magnification of the tip is in place, and then you're going to start injecting air. So what you will see is this white ring that forms, and there's a bubble that forms in the center, and that bubble, then when you take the top two third or half of it away, um, you can puncture the anterior surface of this bubble and release the air. And then you find various ways of cutting the four quadrants, either by putting a spatula underneath, and nowadays we fill it with viscoelastic and then cut those. And this, what is exposed is the predesmis layer on which you put the new cornea with the desmus membrane has been removed. So what you saw happening in the eye bank eye is what is happening here in the human eye. Now, sometimes this happens and we now know that when air is injected, notice the bubble starts at the periphery. It's a much thinner wall bubble. You can tell that just by looking. And it goes across the entire surface of the cornea. Here again, you can see it's important that the bubble will start at the periphery. 
Another one starts at the periphery, and the two of them merge to form this large thin wall bubble, which we call the type two bubble. And this is air that is lifting up the Desmix membrane only, not the pre-Desmix layer. And this is the type two bubble. And this is how you will see it in the human eye. You will see suddenly air will go and all the way to the periphery over there. There is no white ring that formed, just a clear margin going all the way, way beyond the trifine cut. And that is what was also called in the past as the explosive bubble or a clear margin bubble, but that is really a type two bubble. Then we see this sometimes where you will see when you inject air, there's a type one bubble. And over here, there's a small crescent of a type two bubble. Again, in the middle, a type one and a very large sort of horseshoe shaped type two bubble. So these were called mixed bubbles. Some people call it type three bubble, but it's actually not a third type. It is a combination of the one and two types. And in the past, this was attributed to being uh, due to a split in the banded and non-banded zones of the Desmus membrane. Now, clinically, uh, this is a, a video lent to me by a, a good friend and colleague from Cairo, Tarek Katamish. So he's got this nice type one bubble and he opens it, but there's another bubble underneath. So he gently slits the pre layer and you can see it releasing the air. Now you don't really need to split it like that. You can just puncture it with a needle and the air will come out. So you're left with a tiny hole instead of quite a big vent. But nevertheless, you can complete the dark successfully even when you get a, a mixed bubble of that kind of extent um, in, in the clinical situation. So that's your know, different types of bubbles. Now, looking at this further, this was what I call my Eureka moment, one of the very first eyes when we got a type one bubble and we were able to entirely peel off the Desmith's membrane without the bubble bursting. And you can see this rough appearance on the top over here. We can come back to that a little later. That is due to strands separated. They're actually on the posterior surface of what you're seeing here. But those strands have separated the pre layer from the deep stroma of the cornea. But again, this is impervious to air. The bubble does not burst when you peel off the Desmith's membrane from it. And when you do histology of the Desmith's membrane removed from a type one bubble, from a type two bubble, and from a mixed bubble, particularly the mixed bubble, and do histology, you will find that there is never a split between the banded and non-banded zones. That's the endothelium over there. The whole desmus membrane appears intact at all the time. So clearly, we know that the mixed bubble is not due to the split, but it is due to air accumulating between deep stroma and the pre layer, and between pre layer and the desmus membrane. Now, clinically, how is it important? Uh, if you look at that rough appearance, now you're looking from the, uh, the anterior surface of the pre-desmus layer. You can see that rough appearance is due to those strands that have broken off the deep stroma and some of them have, have uh, remained on the pre-desmus layer as against here, which is a type two bubble, an absolutely smooth surface, which is the anterior surface of the desmus membrane. So just by looking under the microscope, you can tell uh, which type of bubble you've got. Now, it's very easy to tell the two different types, but very difficult to predict which type you're going to get and actually make one or the other happen, although there are some tips in the literature, but they don't always work. It is indeed very important to know which type of bubble you've got so for various reasons. Now, for example, here in the eye bank, eye, you can see inside is the, the pre desmith layer bubble and outside is a complete uh, full uh, bubble, which is the type two bubble with air between the pre-desmith layer there and the desmith membrane. Now imagine if you get this situation clinically in the human eye and you want to do after you get the bubble, the next step is the pressure goes up to 60 or so. So you want to do a paracentesis. If you do a paracentesis, you're surely going to burst this type two bubble, the desmith membrane. And believe me, when that bursts, it bursts. And I'll show you. So you want to avoid that. And if you've got something like this, and I showed you this earlier. If you're going to do a paracentesis and you can see where the clear margin is going to avoid your paracentesis at that side, do your paracentesis at the other side, you release the pressure and then you can take the top off. So, and here's an example. So uh, you can see, we didn't know then what type of bubble we got, but just a little touch and the whole bubble has burst. 
So this, you know now, was a type 2 bubble. The Desmet's membrane is completely ripped 360 degrees, and we took it off. So this will happen because the aqueous humor under the Desmet's membrane is pushing it up. And it's very tense, and like a tense balloon, you touch it, it will burst. So you want to avoid that, and by repeatedly releasing aqueous through your paracentesis and keeping the Desmet's membrane flaccid. That's why it's so important to know which type of bubble you've got. Now, this is a video that was lent to me by Kana Ramesh. Um, uh, you can see he's done a successful big bubble, taken the stop off, put the new cornea without the desmets on it, and you hold the eye and just move it. Just that pressure of moving the eye and look what happens. And, and the whole thing just bursts. Now, this will never happen with the type 1 bubble but it is very likely to happen with a type two bubble. Hence, we need to know which bubble we've got. We need to understand what the composition of that bubble is, where uh, Desmus membrane is the only structure in the wall, where you have the PDL, which is much stronger and will, will uh, make the bubble uh, more resilient to your handling and suturing. So that's a good reason to know which kind of bubble you've got. Now, here is an example where we did get a type one bubble, but there was a tear. And the important message here is when you get a tear in a type one bubble, it doesn't burst on you. The tear stays like a tear. See, I'm putting that um, cannula through the tear. And despite that, you can complete the operation successfully, the dark operation, because the pre layer is tamponading. It is supporting the uh, desmus membrane and, and you may have to inject some air in the anterior chamber, just like you do with endothelial keratoplasty to keep the torn edges opposed to the donor cornea. And this is all that was there to see afterwards. There was a little wrinkle, as you can see over here, in, in the predesmus layer, desmus membrane. But the visual access was very clear. And this is after the DALC was completed in that eye. Now, again, sometimes this happens. And it's good to have recording of your surgery. Everybody says that. And you can even intraoperatively stop your surgery, review the, the videos, slow motion to see what's happening. Now, all this will happen very quickly. So just keep your eye on, on what's happening over here. So you're injecting air, you get a white ring bubble and it bursts. And then you're wondering what's happened over here suddenly, an internal burst. Now you take the top off and you can see I'm demarcating that area there, which is another bubble that is trapped. So there's a bubble in the AC, but that bubble is trapped just like it would be in a type one. So I cut it open, put viscoelastic, and then I'm able to uh, take away the top. And when you take away the top, what you notice is there's a mixed bubble. There's one over here, and, but as you touch the edge, aqueous is leaking. So that aqueous is still leaking from the rim, from behind the, the rim that's left behind. So there has been a tear or a disinsertion peripheral. So the central uh, was completely intact. So this could have been a mixed bubble with the internal component that had torn, but we saw the mixed bubble component was over there and there was no tear visible over here directly. So uh, we did the operation, filled it with air, and the next day we were able to see only this line that was there to show where the desmus membrane had just come away from its attachment and the leak was from there over here. And of course, the, the pre-desmus layer was intact over here with the desmus membrane, so the DALC was successful. So very important to know what's happening. Review your video intraoperatively if you're not sure because things can happen so fast and you can make um, very constructive uh, decisions. And this one here, you can see is a patient where something very similar had happened, it's a nine-year-old child who underwent a dull, but the cornea never cleared. So when I was visiting this city, this doctor, Mr. Pillai, brought this patient and the OCT to show me. And he said, during the operation, there was no leak at all of aqueous. Everything looked fine, but the cornea remained edematous. So and you can see clearly, the OCT shows that there's a pre layer over here, but the desmus membrane has torn and curled as it would do. So you've got a mixed bubble over here, and that mixed Fixed component, the desmets has stored. Now, in this situation, if one had intraoperative OCT, that would have been very useful. They could have converted to a PK straight away, but here they didn't. Of course, when they noticed, when they saw this, then they went back 
and we did a PK for this child and had a good outcome. So, so it's very important to understand what's happening. Then with that knowledge, we can understand why it has happened and what we can do to solve it or resolve it or take it to the next step from there. Now, if you look at the scanning EM, uh, what you see is that the Desmus membrane has been cut off. So you're seeing the pre layer in this quadrant. This is the wall of your type one bubble and it extends up to here. But there is this area where the type one bubble is, does not, it does, never extends, but the PDL is there all the way to the periphery. So the PDL goes all the way to the periphery, as you can see over here, the edge, but it is so firmly attached in the peripheral one to one and a half millimeters that it does not separate as a bubble. Now, it's telling us that this plane of cleavage that there is, this definite plane of cleavage which exists between the pre layer and the Desmids membrane, uh, sorry, and, and the, the posterior cornea, that is very clear up to a point. Beyond that, Mechanically, you can separate it further if you, if you want, but air will not separate it. Uh, and it becomes tougher and tougher as you go uh, more towards the periphery, tougher to separate it. So exploit that plane of cleavage. Know that there is a plane of cleavage between the pre layer and the posterior stroma. Now, look what's happened in this patient. And this is one of my patients. So here, we made the, the trifine cut to deep lamellar depth. We put the needle in. We're injecting um, uh, the, the uh, air, and air goes straight in the anterior chamber. So obviously my tip was through Desmids. Now, do we give up? No, you go from another site and you inject. And even if you get a small bubble there, now see when I puncture that, the air from the anterior chamber also comes out. So it's telling us it's coming through Desmids. But that little area where we got a type one bubble is enough. With a spatula, you can move it all the way around, access that plane, completely separate, just as a type one bubble would have done, and you can complete your dial. In fact, towards the end of the operation, there wasn't even a leak from the Desmus membrane. So don't give up, just understand what's happened. And with that knowledge, you can proceed by mechanically exploiting that plane of cleavage. And my colleague here uh, uh, went a step further. He tried visco dissection, and it didn't work. So in this keratoconus patient, they just, physically peeled off the whole cornea from the pre layer. You can see that plane of cleavage and you see those strands that are coming. So it's possible to do this and you can, that much force if you apply on a Desmus membrane it's going to go, but on a pre layer, the cleavage plane is just as good as you got a type one bubble. So exploit that plane of cleavage because it's not just surgeons and you know, fungi also exploit that plane of cleavage and, but that's for, for another day. Now, many surgeons do visco dissection, and I had some reasons to believe they were not doing the same thing because the kind of type one and type two bubbles they were getting were different than what came from air, especially in the post-op OCTs. So we tried to simulate visco bubbles in the lab, and it's very crucial here, the depth at which you put your needle. The depth of the needle is not so important with air, Air will eventually find its way to the predismal plane, but the deeper you are, the better it is. With visco bubbles, absolutely essential. If you put the needle, and this is an OCT with the needle in place, more anterior, all you get is a diffuse spread of viscoelastic without any bubble forming. But if you are in mid stroma, this is where you do get a third type of bubble, and that's called the intrastromal big bubble. So when the viscoat is being deposited there. You do get a separation of the layers at the, the tissue, the stroma, and then it physically tears the layers apart to form a big blob of viscoelastic in the middle of the stroma. And it clinically, intraoperatively looks exactly like a type one bubble. So you can see how if this is the bubble you've got. There's a varying amount of stroma at the back. So you can make your cruciate incision, you can puncture this, cut it out, put a new dial, do an OCT and you'll see variable amount of D-stroma. This is not pre layer. This is just physical tearing of the stroma in the, uh, in the middle of the cornea, just at the point where you are injecting the viscoelastic. 
Um, and here are some other examples uh, we can see. But if you are deep enough and the viscoelastic finds its way to the cleavage plane of the predesmissed layer and the deep stroma, you will get a nice type 1 bubble. But again, even with some deep needles, you can get this, what you think is deep, you can get this large intrastromal big bubble uh, mistaken for a type 1 operation completed, but you've left uh, with not a deep anterior lamellar, but a um, anterior two-thirds lamellar uh, keratoplasty. So moving on now, and we, we show that this the pressure it takes to burst this, it's a strong, you can see here we're injecting air, look at the peripheral escape of air, and then at the pressure of about 700 millimeters of mercury, this thing pops. So it is quite a tough layer. And that is why we all know that DALC is stronger than PK, although you're taking off almost all the corners to put the equal number of sutures as a PK. And that's just to show you the layer is extending to all the way to the periphery of these trees, you see, and that's the layer. So because it is so strong, this is the layer very nicely visible there. Uh, one of my colleagues, again from Cairo, did this whole cataract operation under a, a type 1 bubble. So he was doing a DALC, the patient had a cataract, but then the cataract was done. And many of these uh, papers we published, uh, Muhammad uh, Shafiq al Alfi is his co author. So in one of the patients, there was vitreous loss, we did a whole vitrectomy underneath this, and then put the cornea, new cornea on. And uh, we call this the DALC triple operation. Here is a non folding lens being introduced into the sulcus. So all that was done, and then the uh, operation completed. So that is also published as a dark triple operation, and here are some pre and post operative examples. Now, moving on to PDEC and DMEC. So we can create a type 1 bubble, and this was the very first video where we demonstrated this concept and was published in the BGO with the PDEC paper with Amar Agarwal from India. You can suck the air out and either with a trefine or with a pair of scissors, cut along the edge of the bubble and you can then peel this layer, which is a construct of predesmitz layer, desmitz membrane and endothelium. And that is your tissue for endothelial keratoplasty. It is not, it does not scroll as much as the desmitz membrane and it is easier to unscroll in the eye than the desmitz membrane. So the more you have to spend effort and energy to unscroll the tissue, the eye, the more is your endothelial cell loss. So that way, uh, it, it is uh, better in, in that respect. But it's obviously smaller. And uh, we now know that there are at least three uh, eye banks in America who, who supply pre-prepared PDEC tissue. So if you get a type one bubble, like you see over here, then you have to do DMEC. You can't do PDEC. So for doing PDEC, you want to avoid a type 1 bubble. Otherwise, you're left with only desmus membrane. Now, the other point that we want to, uh, I want to mention here is that the predesmitz layer continues beyond the termination of the desmus membrane as the collagen core of the trabecular meshwork. So most of the collagen in the meshwork is the spreading out of the lamellae of the predesmitz layer. And on the scanning electron microscope, so you can see over here, the desmus membrane has been removed. That's the predesmitz layer. And that predesmitz layer actually becomes the beams of the trabecular meshwork. And that's an example of a scarf. You can see it knitted with wool. And it's the same kind of material that is within the wool is coming out to form the trabecular meshwork. So it's a continuum. The trabecular meshwork continues with the predesmitz layer of the cornea. Now, remember I said that the predesmitz layer is impervious to air? Then how does air get through it to form a type 2 bubble? There must be a way. But the answer lies in the fact that the type 2 bubble always starts at the periphery in most of these instances. So you mark the point where a type 2 bubble starts. And once it's formed, you peel off the desmus membrane and you look underneath. And what you find is there are 15 uh, to 17 such clusters of fenestrations over there at the periphery. And they may be single or they may be multiple, and they're between 
five to 60 microns, average 20 microns in size. And if you, and that's distributed around the periphery, regardless of whether you have injected air or not, you will see these fenestrations. So look at this very high power magnification of the pre desmich layer at the periphery where it is becoming the trabecular meshwork and there are some holes over here. So if your desmich membrane is attached here and air is escaping from these holes, then it will go into the anterior chamber. And we have seen this, anybody who does dark knows that you can often get air in the anterior chamber. But if that layer is attached here, the desmich membrane ends here according to this white line, then air escaping will go directly underneath the um, desmich membrane. The, the air will go directly under the desmich membrane and lift the desmich membrane off like a type two bubble. So now you can understand why it starts at the periphery, why you get type two, why you get type one in some cases. And, but that knowledge you know, helps us. So again, taking that science a step further, we said, okay, we want to avoid a type two bubble. So what do we do? We can make a clamp. We can make a clamp that clamps out all these holes. And that's what we did. It's called the PDEC clamp. And then you clamp them shut and that's the clamp over there. There's a mark to show you where the hole is and there's a hole at the side before your insertion of the needle. And once it's properly centered, very important to center it properly. And then you inject air and you can see not a bubble of air escapes anywhere in the periphery. All the air you're injecting is contained within it. So the intra tissue pressure has to rise to a certain level for the air to make its way to the pre plane. So with this clamp in place and no air escaping, all air you're injecting is contributing towards that rise of pressure slowly. If a lot of air is escaping, you have to push more to overcome the pressure loss due to the loss of air and then to form the bubble. Suddenly you get too much and it pops. So this way, a very controlled injection to very consistently get a type one bubble. And we came across now with this idea with, uh, with uh, Nicholas, uh, Cesario from, from, uh, from Brazil. And this is a poor man's approach. It's, the idea is that you take a scorer and you score the desmets at the periphery. So once you've scored the desmets at the periphery and you're injecting air, a lot of air will escape. So you won't get that control injection, but because air is escaping out beyond the edges of the desmets membrane that you've scored, it will not form a type two bubble and you will always get a type one bubble when it eventually comes. So it's another way to avoid a type two bubble when you want to get PDEC tissue. And that's this paper that's been now accepted and online published in the BJO. So here's the uh, PDEC operation. You can see here we're cutting the, the donor tissue with the scissors. You can load it into a cartridge. Of course, nowadays we have all those fancy cartridges and you can use any one of them. The PDEC tissue also rolls with the desmets, uh, with the endothelial cells outside. So that's important to know. It's just like DMEC rolled with the endothelial cells outside, flatten it, inject air, put it, in, and the, the operation is done. And you can see these post-operative images. And there are people now in, in, the, in the world who've done many, many, many more than I have done, uh, particularly Agarwal and, and Dr. Stidney in, in Poland, and there are a few others. So, but the outcomes are exactly the same as, as uh, DMEC. Very good. And for people who are worried about the time it takes to unroll and all the rest, it's a good learning step. Uh, but because the outcomes are system, uh, similar, it becomes the operation of choice for, for many. And now moving on with the science, uh, it was published in 2016 that the pre layer has a higher concentration of elastin than the rest of the cornea. This was by a very elaborate uh, on-face scanning electron microscopic study, which uh, was uh, carried out by um, uh, Dr. Keith Meek's group in Cardiff. Uh, initially, they, they, in, as rightly so, many people were skeptical about whether the layer is there or not. And then they started producing evidence not only to show that the layer is there, but how it was different from the rest of the corneas. So this was one such example. Uh, then we said, okay, that, let us look into that in detail because this is not very convincing with some, although, although they had a very convincing uh, kind of measurement to show that more elastin in the pre-dismiss layer. So um, with Mohammed Imran, who's one of my senior scientists, 
we quantitated biochemically the amount of elastin in different parts of the cornea. And you can see the pre desmids layer has the highest concentration, even more than desmids membrane. And that elastin is not statistically significant from the trabecular meshwork beams. And we know that the trabecular meshwork has collagen, elastin, basement membrane, and the trabecular cells. So as we said, this is a continuation of that. And you can see it's pretty similar in elastin content at least, but there was a statistically significantly difference, more elastin in the PDL than in the desmids and in other parts of the cornea and the sclera. And if you then look at the PDEC tissue here, and it scrolls less of the grading, there's a grading scale and you, mark, you can quantitate the grade from zero to four. And then if you very carefully peel out the desmids, from the pre desmids layer in that tissue and lay them side by side, you'll find suddenly the desmids or the DMEC tissue will scroll a lot more than the PDEC tissue, which scrolls just a little bit with the, than the PDL, sorry, because that's the PDEC tissue. So again, in these four examples, you can see the PDL scrolls the least, the desmids membrane the most, and the PDEC tissue in between. And all of this and this, the scroll with the endothelial cells outside and you can actually quantitate the grading and you can see um, how much it is different with uh, in the pre desmids layer the least the desmids membrane the most but this is where it becomes even more interesting so if you take the pre desmids layer and you stain it for elastin and this took us believe me two and a half years to optimize the staining of elastin in the tissue many many of us tried it and just only imran was able to do it finally in, in our labs so the, the elastin in the pre desmids layer is present all the way through, diffuse and a lot of it. The elastin in the desmids membrane is present only as a band, very dense band on the anterior surface of the desmids membrane. Here's PDEC tissue. So you can see the desmids membrane with the band is here. The desmids membrane, most of it has hardly anything. Uh, and we sort of suspect that most of this band is corresponding to, if not a, all of it, to part of the banded zone of the desmids membrane. And, and there on the, on the top, you can see the, the PDL, the pre-desmids, they have very high concentration of elastin. And here we've taken off part of the PDL to show that's the difference. So the desmids membrane, no elastin, there quite a bit of elastin and the band is very, very intense. So that's one. If we then, those were the controls. And if you look at the whole cornea, okay? The previous one was where we had separated the layers. This is the whole cornea and you can see the desmids membrane with this band, the interfacial matrix, the pre desmids layer over there with the high elastin content and then the stroma with the, or uh, staining around the keratocyte. So that is the, um, the histology telling us that the pre desmids layer is a distinct part of the cornea, especially in as far as its elastin content is concerned. So it's not only another layer, but it's also a, 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 a distinct structurally. So coming back to the clinical relevance, the question is why does the DMEC and PDEC tissue always scroll with the endothelial cell outside? So clearly, all the scrolling of the PDEC is brought about by the desmids membrane. So if you take the desmids, the PDL doesn't scroll a lot. But so the desmids membrane, why does it always scroll with the endothelial cells outside? And the answer you will find in the literature is one is elasticity. And the other, the swollen endothelial cells in the postmortem eye, as they swell, they push the desmids up and cause it to scroll with the cells outside. Now, time and time again, we've learned from my experience that you can't believe everything in the literature unless there is evidence to support it. So we tried to find the evidence. So what we did was we take this DMEC tissue and you put elastase enzyme and you leave it. And over time, spontaneously, you don't have to do anything, this scroll automatically starts to open and then it completely opens as you see over there. It goes flat. And then when you take a histology of this section and stain for elastin, you'll see the elastin is all fragmented. The band in the control is very nice and still present here it's gone. And the same happens with the lens capsule, the 
lens capture will also roll with the epithelial cells outside in similar kind of a band, but the band is not so distinct as in Desmos. So clearly, it is this elastic band which is responsible for the scrolling and the endothelial cells are over here. So it scrolls inwards, making it uh, like a tube or a, a double barrel with the endothelial cells outside. So what about the, what about the, uh, the endothelial cells itself? Um, uh, well, um, I'm not sure if I've got the slide over now, but when we, I'll say it now, and if I, the slide comes up, I'll repeat this bit. So if you treat the desmus membrane with endothelial cells with dyspase enzyme, it's a very gentle enzyme which removes all the cells. And you put an F mark and you let it scroll, it still scrolls exactly the same way. So with no endothelial cells on the desmus, it will still scroll with the, the posterior surface of the desmus membrane outside. But this is my explanation that this elasticity is what makes it scroll. So this is a very crude illustration of that. So here in this video, so this rubber band is that band of elastin. So if I stretch it, it comes back. That is your PDL, your pre-desmus layer is like that. If, if you make a type one bubble, you see you, it goes down as the bubble and you leave it, it comes back up. So always the PDL comes, so that is the PDL. Now imagine this band is the band of elastin, okay? So it's a different imagination. I put glue on it and you stick it to the strip of paper. So this is your desmus membrane with the anterior band of elastin. So sometimes you have to work with three hands, it works better. So you see now, if you leave that, look what happens in slow motion to that strip of paper, which is the desmus membrane. This is the elastin band, those bits that were not glued. And you see, it will scroll with the endothelial cells, the blue color outside. And it's even more obvious that because the band didn't go right across the lens. So if you cut out that excess bit and you show that, and it almost forms a tube. And uh, so showing you exactly how the desmus will scroll because that elastin band is on the anterior surface of the desmus membrane. Yeah, this is that slide I was telling you about. So endothelial cells present, endothelial cells absent, because of dyspase, put an F mark and it scrolls exactly the same way, same with the lens capsule. So endothelial cells do not play any role in uh, the scrolling. It is all that elastin band. Now, I, I say this every time I give this talk, that God didn't put that band so that we can do DMEC. There's a physiological role for it. And what is that physiological role? Now you can imagine there is no anatomical adhesion between the decimates and the stroma. Yet this close apposition of the two is so crucial for the desmets endothelium to function in keeping the cornea clear. And that close apposition, if it was structurally, any, every time you blink, you squeeze, you rub your eyes, you can induce shearing forces which can tear your desmets. Uh, so here you have an interfacial matrix which allows that to happen, yet it is opposed because it's going to scroll in that direction. You go to scroll where the arrows are pointing and that force keeps it pressed against the back of the cornea without any need for an anatomical connection. And I think that's the purpose why this elastin uh, uh, band of the desmets uh, works to keep the desmets against the back of the cornea. So in summary, uh, we can look at this as the pre layer and our knowledge of its behavior, its structure, its constituents, and as part of that research of the desmets membrane and the desmets membrane behavior constitution, particularly the elastin distribution, has improved our understanding of corneal surgical anatomy, of DALC and other lamellar corneal surgery like PDEC and DMEC. It has made DALC much safer. We know which bubbles to protect. We get a type to bubble, you can take all the precautions and still get a very good outcome if you know you've got a type two and you know what precautions to take and you won't do those things that can make it burst easily, just keep it flaccid, a repeated release of aqueous. It has led to the innovation of three new surgical procedures and I didn't mention the third one, which is suture management of acute hydrox. 
So um, Muren's group from France has shown that if you get acute hydrops in, in kinetochronus and you only oppose the torn edges of the, the, um, if you, uh, the, the pre-desmus layer and you don't have to oppose the torn edges of the desmus membrane, it will be opposed. And when they're opposed like that, you can get rapid resolution of uh, acute hydrops. And there's very recently a paper uh, by Melis's group, which is very interesting, and I didn't include it in this talk. I thought I'd run, I would run over time, but in keratoconus, they tried to do Bowman's membrane transplant, and during that procedure, they often got desmus membrane detachment only, and they never got acute hydrops. But in those cases where they uh, were trying to do a Bowman's membrane transplant and they penetrated internally and they ruptured the pre desmus layer also, they got acute hydrops. And they then wrote this paper to corroborate what we said in our very first paper in 2013, acute hydrops is due to a tear in the pre desmus layer and desmus membrane, not due to a tear in the desmus membrane only. And they actually acknowledged that the pre desmus layer has a critical role in inducing acute hydrops. And we had done a little experiment long back, which was a negative experiment, where we took normal human eye bank eyes and we made a slit in the back of the eye through desmus and PDL, mounted on an anterior chamber and pushed the pressure up to 80 or 60. We never got acute hydrops. So we wrote a letter in response to their paper that that is true, you need a tear in the PDL and the desmus membrane, but only in the context of the abnormal collagen of keratoconus, it does not happen in normal eyes. Uh, but there, so there's two important messages there. One, we now understand the pathology of uh, uh, acute hydrops, and that Mellis also now acknowledges that yeah, this layer is there. And, and a very recent paper that we published uh, in, in uh, AJO, that desmus membrane detachment is of three types, type one, type two, and mixed, exactly like the bubbles. Spontaneous desmus membrane detachment will happen. And very often, we hadn't realized that the desmus membrane detachment, the PDL and the desmus in a very straight line, you will see on the slit lamp across the back of the cornea. They're more difficult to put back because they bounce back. Whereas if you get only desmus membrane detachment, it's very wavy, it's not a straight line and easier to put back. So our understanding of corneal pathology, desmetoses mostly have PDL on it, desmus detachment just told you, acute hydrops, and uh, spread of infection. Uh, this is uh, again to do with pathology, so I've not put it in this talk because it's mostly surgery. Uh, and uh, we're looking at it now. We've got two little grants uh, of about um, 30,000 pounds to look at uh, the role of the um, predesmus layer in corneal biomechanics and in glaucoma. So, with more to come. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Prof. And uh, this is very, very enlightening. And uh, um, actually invites the brains to work and <laughs> brings more and more questions from real life uh, situations. So um, I would like to start uh, by the question uh, around the decimate membrane detachment during phaco surgery. You do a beautiful cataract surgery and then towards the end you start hydrating your wounds and then you find that there is actually decimate detachment. So when do you leave a bubble? When do you take a suture? Uh, how can you feel confident about leaving it? Sometimes it, it, it rolls back in place, but you can still see a tear. Um, any any uh, uh, opinion on this, Prof? So the, it's, many people have noticed this. If you've got uh, the older the eye, uh, the thicker the desmets, the easier it is to separate or tear during phaco surgery. And that kind of separation occurs when you make the wound and you're putting your probes through the wound, right at the main phaco wound. And the, the way to avoid that is to be a bit more peripheral with your incision. The more centrally you go, the, the looser it is attached. And we know this when we make our DMIC preps now. If you try to separate right at the periphery, it tears. But you go a little central, it comes more smoothly. And that's what happened. And the other thing is that when you're putting your probe down, always press the posterior lip down as it, because people don't do that movement. They go straight in and they're pushing and pushing and they then they rip the desmet. So first best thing is to avoid it. 
the second thing is that you know a slightly looser wound is much safer than trying to say, oh, I'm like a one millimeter PECO surgeon and all that's nonsense because you're going to risk taking a bigger risk. So don't try and force things in, let them go in and out smoothly. Same happens when you're trying to put your lens injector in toward the end of the operation. If you're to a very tight wound, you're doing more damage, taking a bigger risk than if you open it a little bit more. Let's go in smoothly in and out. Not the end of the world if your wound is two millimeters instead of one and a half, you will get a, a, a much less risk. Now, when, you, when you're doing your side port hydration, and that time is purely the plane in which the saline has gone. Just like with air, it'll separate and type two bubble, or with viscoat, it'll do that. It'll do it with, uh, with BSS as well. In these situations, unless there's a flap or unless there's a scroll, you just leave it alone, it will settle. But if there's a proper scroll and it's at the periphery, then uh, you can still leave it alone. But if it's closer to the center, then it's a problem. And what you'll find is that this is something very interesting. And I have this observation, I've never found an answer. The Desmet's membrane, whenever there's a damage or disease, where the area is, you get edema only above that. Almost like it's like a clear cut. It doesn't sort of spread. So it's only in that area where you have the tear, you will get edema. And that will be peripheral and invariably settles over time. We have seen even when you get a type 2 detachment with the PDL has also come off. Um, uh, over time, that, that will, will, uh, will seal. So unless there's a tear and there's a scroll or there's flapping like that, we don't need to really repair it. Thank you. And, and the, the brilliant work about the uh, elastin and how the elastin can dissolve and affects uh, how the uh, tissue uh, rolls. Um, what's your opinion on uh, diseases that causes elastin uh, deficiency or abnormality like in pseudosensoma elasticum or in Marfan disease? Uh, would you expect that to make the, the, the posterior anatomy and how the uh, decimate layer and uh, do as their behave would be different? It would. In fact, uh, a better uh, example is keratoconus, where it's already shown that the elastic or the elasticity of the PDL is uh, degraded or has become pathologically altered uh, in early keratoconus. So it may be, and something we're looking at, uh, again, the, we got, actually we got from Egypt, again from Cairo, so a lot of Egyptian connection here, uh, some eyes with acute high drops um, where PK was done to see, or, or advanced keratoconus where a PK was done to see how the elastin is changed in the predesmis layer. And unfortunately, because of the logistics of transport, it had to be say, uh, preserved in, or fixed in paraformaldehyde. And our uh, antibody doesn't work on paraformaldehyde fixed tissue. It only works on triofix tissue. So we have to go back to the drawing board. But I think we will be able to show soon that that is indeed the case. So clearly, in the examples you have mentioned, like Marfan's and pseudoxanthoma, the cornea is thin, and we know that the biomechanics is completely altered. And therefore, when these people have what we call the brittle cornea, a little injury, and they get tears and ruptures all the time of the corneas, so it's possible that the elasticity of the cornea is gone, the resilience is gone, therefore it tends to tear more often. So we will find more and more of these as, as the um, understanding improves and more people take interest in doing research. See, the good thing for me was a lot of people first didn't believe it's there, so we got to do all the research and prove all the points. Now other people have started doing, so more and more information will emerge from various parts of the world. Okay, Prof. And, and um, we go to the uh, Dalk and the beautiful videos there. Uh, you advise don't give up. Yeah. But can you give us a simple advice on when it is the time to decide to convert to a PK? Stop trying to save it. So it's simple. Uh, if you've injected so much air that everything has gone so opaque, you can't see anything more. So then you. Take the top off and visibility might improve. And then you can inject more and see if you can. And if you can't, so we don't give up at that point. So if you don't get a bubble, doesn't mean you give up on dark. There are various strategies you can adopt to do lamellar separation. 
And I'm amazed at the number of times. It takes more time, it's more tedious, but they're separating layer by layer and you strike the right plane. And as soon as you strike it, you can put your spatula in and then separate. But equally, uh, there have been occasions when you've spent all that time and you've gone right through. And then you had to convert to PK one hour later. And you said, you know, what a waste of time. So I would still prefer that one hour wasted for the eyes where I have been able to achieve a dark by very deep uh, separation with, uh, with um, laminate section. So there's a theoretical um, figure that if you're 100 microns or less of stroma left behind, you get a very good outcome, visually speaking. And that's the rationale behind ultra thin DSEC as well. So when you have less than 100 microns stroma, it doesn't matter. The visual outcome is good. So the same applies for DALF, but it can be hit and miss. And, and how large of a, uh, of a decimate tear that you can uh, leave and still try, uh, or you just convert? Three no, no, hours, four if hours? you have a decimate membrane tear with a, a type one bubble, with a PDL or some, or you didn't get any high laminates, you can leave it with a large one. But if you have a type two bubble, it it extends and it rolls, and there's no way you can put it back, uh, particularly during a dark. And you try to put it back, you've done a lot of damage that edema never clears, or you get a double anterior chamber. So, if it is supported by the PDL or some deep stroma, you can you can leave it. I haven't sort of I can't give you a figure on how many millimeters you leave and how many you do, but just use yeah, but, but with the uh, the understanding of type one or type two, then you can yes. decide whether to leave or convert. Yes. Yes. Okay. So so and and how to improve the chances of getting a type one big bubble in dark surgery? Again, I have some thoughts which I can't tell you. As you remember my famous saying, if I tell you, I have to shoot you. <laughs> yeah, you know, you don't have to do it now. <laughs> no, but but uh, what uh, what I think the principle is: the deeper you are, the better. The deeper you are, the better. But for some reason, um, nowadays we have OCT. So if you have a scar, an inflammatory scar post-infection or any other inflammation, then you're less likely to get a type 1 bubble. You, you can get a type 2, but that's not the end of the world because PDL then gets scarred into the, uh, the stroma. And the same happens, you know, when you get the type 1 desmus membrane detachment. The detached predesmus layer if you leave it long, and we had this, we got histology on five cases where we proved that. Uh, in, in three of them, there were no cells in the PDL. And in two of them, the keratocytes have migrated into the predesmus layer. So it's become heavily populated with keratocytes. They will produce scar tissue and it'll become like contracted. And that then you, however much you try to push it, it'll spring back. So then you have to do a desmetotomy to release it. So the PDL does get scarred with inflammation or with disease. And if the PDL is scarred in an eye, you're trying to attempt a bubble, you're more likely to get a type two. Okay, and for, for somebody who's starting, so, so we do uh, DMX, um, I would say routinely for uh, endothelial keratoplasty uh, in our place. So if we want to start doing PDEX while we have good experience in DMEC, what is your advice? And what's your advice for somebody who's just starting to learn endothelial keratoplasty? Can they go directly to PDEC or do they have to learn doing these acts first? I think it's your choice. See, what happens is that, um, I think it applies to you too, to some extent, but definitely applies to people like me and my age. We all learned this on the job, right? There was nobody who we were working with who taught us how to do this, that, or the other. So you try everything, whichever you're comfortable with, you do that. There are three, four different ways of doing a DALF. I looked at all four of them and I thought the big bubble technique was the best and I picked that and I developed it. The same happens with, so if you're working with somebody who's very good in DMEC and that's where you train, then obviously you don't have to look for any other technique. But bear in mind that if you have a cornea of 50, 55 years or younger and you are going to do a DMEC, you're going to be in trouble. In trouble for two or three reasons. In fact, Say you've got a cornea five-year-old and you're trying to do, do a, a, a DMEC. Forget it. It's not going to happen. It's going to tear. So the, the, the younger the cornea, and from Agarwal's experience, 
And if you do a PDEC, the amount of clarity of the stromal hair, because they're doing eyes where the corneal stroma is very hazy for long-standing edema. It is absolutely amazing how young endothelial cells uh, clear the cornea so much better than the older endothelial cells. So if you want to use a young cornea, you have to do a PDEC, you can't do a, a DMEC. So that it will be one consideration where you will really need to do a PDEC. So, and, and if there are advantages shown of younger donors, then clearly that will be a, a good reason to go for, for PDEC. Last question from, from, from my side here. Um, for the intrastromal big bubble, a very interesting concept with, with viscoelastic. Can you actually plan an anterior lamellar keratoplasty and you get a residual um, homogeneous thickness left behind with this way? It's not homogeneous, that's the problem. It will leave behind a fair amount, but you can see in the illustrations I've told you, and I think that was published in ACTA or in BGO. In BGO. It's thicker at some end, thinner at the other end, and the size of the bubble is not controlled. With the, with the type one bubble, you know, it goes to a certain point, it's eight and a half millimeters, maximum nine, and it's nice and circular, and it's usually very, very central. This can be anywhere. Uh, and I know Dr. Guell does this, Jose Guell from, uh, he did, he's an excellent surgeon, but then he and I, and then when I showed him these, and he says, well, he'll have to go back and check all his post op to see how much stroma he's leaving behind. Because they used to call this a type one and a type two. The intrastromal bubble, they were causing, causing type one, and the type one, they were calling a type two. Because they never get a true type two with viscoelastic. It just doesn't go through these tiny holes to create a decimus membrane separation. So it's like, you know, like everything we do, we've been looking at decimus membrane detachments for more than 100 years. And nobody ever picked up that we're actually detaching the PDL. In, in many of these spontaneous detachments happen with the PDL intact. Now we know that we're seeing. So as soon as you understand and you know, you start understanding. And the same with the visco bubbles. Um, they, they, they will come out to show how many of them are actually intrastromal bubbles. But I think it's a good idea what you're saying that if you can show that the cleavage is regular, then you can use it for anterior lamina because it is at the plane of the needle that the separation occurs. But it's not that it's not a plane of cleavage. You're ripping it apart and it can tear in any direction. Hey, th thank you, Prof. Uh, Artemis, any more questions? Um, yeah, we have some from the audience. So there is a question from Facebook and our feed as well, uh, asking uh, what are the difficulties and if it is tougher to do a big bubble on a cross-linked cornea? The difficulties in the big bubble? Uh, in a cornea that has had cross-linking. Oh, cross-linking, yeah, yeah. So um, people have done successful dark after uh, cross-linking. Um, that's well reported. And you can do a successful dark and you still get the type one bubble. Uh, there are various little unanswered questions. So I'm sure people who will start doing this need to go. So if you want to look to answer one question is, how does air travel in the stroma? And my hypothesis is around the keratocyte spaces. So the keratocytes allow the air to travel around them because there's a space. And cross-linking happens in the collagen, not across keratocytes. So there will always be a space, right, through which the air will travel. And it's like, you know, if you have a pile of stones and you put water, it doesn't go through the stones, but it goes around them and reaches the plane at the bottom. So the same kind of example, when the air will find its way, whether the collagen is cross-linked or not. Because what we see is that the older you are, the more cross-linked your cornea is naturally uh, with age and the, the chance of getting a type of just as good there as with, with the younger cornea. It only is easier with keratoconus than with non keratoconus size. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, yeah. And uh, do you believe that advances in laser technology would allow laser assisted PDEC? It's already there. People have used that phrase. What they do is they they use a femto laser to create the tunnel as deep as possible. So in the beginning I said, the deeper the better. So the deeper you can create that plane, the, the more the chances there will go straight into the, uh, 
into the plane. Now, we are also in this particular study uh, showing if you put the bevel down, the bevel up, or bevel side, uh, the chance of getting bubble are just the same because it will always follow that pattern. It goes circumferential first, comes centripetally, and then lifts the tissue up. So we, we have got this bevel down or the hole at the bottom to direct the air downwards, but air doesn't follow the direction of the hole. It will go from there. The force will be down, but it will find these spaces that it has to reach the plane, but it will also come up. So many times we have seen with the cannula with the hole down, it is going all over the place, the air, and the whole corner becomes uh, full of air. So um, the deeper is better, but it's not a guarantee that you will get uh, a tight plane. That's what PEMTO will allow you to do. Because see, you can't make a cleavage plane very deep. But then you're working so close to the endothelium with the femto, and what it's going to do to the endothelium, we don't know. So no point having a nice type one, the endothelium is gone. Yeah, true. Um, now, I think you've already touched upon it, but do you think that elastin can be used in clinical practice when we have a younger donor, and it's obviously more likely to get a tight scroll or difficulty in preparing the graft? Mm. Do you think that there's any application? Yeah, we've already got some data on that. Mm -hmm. So what, what you have to do is, we, the, we, the, the, the question is that you can use elastase to weaken temporarily the elasticity. So you need the right concentration, you need the right duration and the right temperature. So that, and these have to be reversible. The effect has to be reversible. So you can imagine the weight right scroll you dip it in a certain concentration of elastase in theater with for a certain duration at a certain temperature, you get the maximal loosening of this elasticity. Then you, you put it in the eye, unroll it quickly, put the air bubble, and then let it recover. And it should recover. And the process should not cause more endothelial cells to fall off. So a lot of work needs to be done to optimize all these things. Now, Andrew Ross, who again is from Egypt, but not from Cairo, he was my fellow here, and he's going to hopefully come back as a clinical assistant professor, which is the lecturer in the SP training program. Um, he started this work. We have already got some data on, on getting it to unscroll, not fully unscroll, but just weakening it. So it is, an, it is a, a potential clinical application. That's interesting. Um, another question. Is it possible to create type 1 bubble in corneas with aniridia? It, I, it should be. In fact, we might have actually done it in a couple because a lot of these patients, in fact, I'm not sure if you will create a type 1 or type 2, but uh, uh, we have definitely done DALC in Anaridi, and I'm trying to think back. The most recent one was a type 2, and the decimus 1 membrane right up to the mid vitreous it went because, you know, there's nothing, no lens behind it. They've had all this done in the past. So you can imagine... Uh, if you get that kind of a detachment, then get it to come and attach back to your new donor with the, the separation is much wider. But uh, what the numbers are not just big enough to give a definitive answer. But uh, my suspicion is you're going to get more type 2 than type 1. Mm -hmm. um, another question. Could chronic inflammation lead to spontaneous decimates membrane detachment? Or of course. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's what we've shown in this paper. It published last year in American Journal of Ophthalmology, in, you know, a novel um, classification and um, whatever, I forget an investments member detachment, novel concept in um, classification and uh, oh, I forgot the name myself. Anyway, it, if you read that, you will see that all the spontaneous detachments and they, they can occur with chronic edema. Chronic inflammation, vascular, it's a post cornea transplants that have failed. And post, um, most of them are iatrogenic, following cataract surgery uh, that they have uh, spontaneously separated. So we didn't include any patient who had an uh, endothelial graft procedure. So these are all spontaneous detachments. Um, and I think there is one more from the feed. Is there any role for the PDL in the delayed decimal detachment after penetrating keratoplasty? 
role of PDL in that. Mm. Yeah, that is where you have, in fact, one of the patients we have reported histology on was, uh, so we had good clinical pictures, slit lamp pictures. What you see is that you get a, it's like a chord of a circle. So you've got a cornea which is curved in a straight line. Whenever you see a straight line detachment, you will see that is a type one detachment. And this was in a patient, we've got I think two or three patients in the total series of 40, 50 patients um, that they were post cornea transplant. So any chronic edema or chronic inflammation can lead to spontaneous detachment of the uh, desmus membrane and in all uh, of the, the P type 1 desmus detachments of, of the PDL and even acute hydrops. And again, you know, this, this is, can be regmatogenous or non regmat So acute hydrops, even in pellicid marginal degeneration as a type 1 detachment uh, with, with one part torn. So where the tear is, is very localized, but the detachment goes way beyond that. You can see that the the morphology there is of a type one detachment. And one just came through actually now on Facebook. So in cross-linked cornea with a scar and no edema, how to know that decimates membrane is healthy even um, even if the scar seems to be continuous with decimates membrane? So so very simple. You know, you whenever you, this applies not just to this example but everywhere. If there is no corneal edema. The desmus is fine, right? Even if it is scarred, and you can see the scarred, the scar area, but if there's no corneal edema or overlying epithelial fine bully, then you know the endothelium is working fine, right? So some people, even after acute high drops, where you know that the desmus was torn, they will do a dalk by lamellar separation. So don't try it with air because air will rip it apart. It has healed. The endothelium has grown back. Although the, the, you would still see the scroll of the tear of the PDL and the desmus, but the endothelium has bridged the gap. So there is no edema. It's telling you the endothelial function is okay. But if you try with air, you'll rip it apart. But they go, uh, and my colleague here, Dr. Said, has done that. They go mechanically, and the region of the tear in the hydrops, which you have identified, you leave a bit of deep stroma behind. So you don't disturb that area, and then you do your dal. And if it is eccentric, you get a good visual outcome and leaving the patient's own endothelium. So just look for edema. I mean, we see this in chemical burns, you know, the cornea is all over the place, but look at the cornea now, its thickness is either thinner or normal, and they're scarred and vessels. But if there was no desmes, this would go chronic edema, and then you will see that edema, it doesn't come back so the, if the endothelium is not working. So clinically, that's the best clue. Thank you. Um, I think we can um, carry on bombarding you with questions, but we're already overrun with this session. So um, I think we can uh, conclude, Mr. Lalfi. Well, thank you so much, uh, Professor Dua, for uh, uh, accepting the invitation and giving us uh, a little bit of your uh, very, very uh, busy time. We can never have uh, enough of your talks uh, as, as, the, as is usually the case. So thank you for, uh, for joining, and thank we you. hope to see you more and more very, very soon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. So I'll just uh, very briefly remind everyone about our next um, uh, webinar, which is uh, scheduled for Wednesday, the 12th of May. So Ms. Dahlia Said will talk about uh, a roadmap to managing infectious keratitis. So please save the date, and we are looking forward to see you all there soon. Um, thank you very much once more, and to the audience, both on Facebook for our live and here on Zoom. And uh, have a lovely evening, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.